Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is AI, an equalizer or competitive advantage. Hello, Zeta Live. I am Steve Gerber, the president and COO at Zeta Global. I've been at Zeta for 14 years, but I've been in the digital industry for 25 years, or as my teenage daughter says, since the 1900s. And she says it like it's an era from a Yellowstone prequel. But we're not going to talk about a topic of yesteryear. We're going to talk about the topic of this year, this decade, and maybe even this century. AI and its impact on enterprises and, and its impact on marketing. I am joined by an esteemed panel of experts to have this discussion. First to my left, Janet Bayless, industry luminary, CMO whisperer, and head of the marketing practice at EY. Ramon Jones, who is driving the digital transformation at Nationwide. Laura Davis, Chief Strategy Officer at Yahoo, part of the executive team that is executing one of the most amazing turnarounds in the history of digital. And Matt Lapman, who runs card acquisition at Discover, one of the most innovative thinkers and analytical practitioners in the space. So let's get to it. It wouldn't be a panel if I didn't have slides. So. Three quarters in to 2023, still three days, Kelly, to close out this quarter. But uh, 2023 is shaping up to be a historic year, and it's been defined by two phenomena, Taylor Swift and AI. <laughs> but more specifically, the Eras Tour and Gen AI. So the first question, Janet, is, AI as a concept has been around for decades, since the 1900s. And it's just in the last seven or eight months, even though companies like Zeta have been doing AI for seven or eight years, that it's catalyzed the conversation, that it's become finally a boardroom topic. Why is that? Well, first, let me say it is a privilege to uh, be on the obligatory hype panel about AI. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think it is um, a, a really remarkably important topic, in all seriousness. And it is because generative AI has created a remarkable tipping point for the conversation around, as you point out, technologies that have been around for a tremendously long time, machine learning, deep learning, predictive analytics, and AI are all techniques that come together when we are able to democratize access uh, to many of the techniques that allow us to uh, be able to have that on-ramp into uh, these more advanced techniques. There's no question that when you have something like ChatGPT, which was obviously a, a turning point when it skyrockets to 100 million users, and it's obviously peaked higher than that, uh, that it creates a tremendous groundswell of activity. But I also think the other piece of this is that it's a gateway to all those other technologies in AI beyond generative AI, but generative AI was the moment that allowed a lot of people to make it real, and where we see a convergence between consumer behaviors uh, in our personal lives and our business lives that allow us to make this technology far more tangible. So I think that's what's putting it over the edge. But I don't think that, to your point, this is a, a, something that's just at this moment. This is here to stay. Great. Matt? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Janet. I think um, if you go to the user experience of ChatGPT, it's quite easy, right? So. You know, not everybody, maybe I'm probably the only person in this room that builds machine learning models for fun, um, which I do, but credit models and things like that have been, we've been using machine learning in every day for a long time, but it's not accessible to people. And to be able to go in to a GPT interface and write a Taylor Swift and Coolio mashup in two seconds and see it is just, I mean, it's magic for people. So it, it becomes real and then after we get through all of that stuff that's not really use, useful in, in real life, we can start to figure out how we monetize it and how we bring it into everyday industry. Great. Laura, closing out this I, question. I would just add to that. I think the democratization has been just phenomenal over the last year after ChatGPT created all of the buzz. We've only seen a few of these moments in history, in the, in the history of technology, right? We saw it with the dawn of the internet, mobile, and now, and cloud, and now generative AI. 
and those moments really happen when you have this convergence of technology capabilities and then what, and customer adoption and real use cases that customers can see. Um, and to Matt's point, you know, when a 13-year-old with no college education or coding abilities can, you know, insert a prompt in a chat GPT and generate, you know, real output, you could see the impact of what that is. I also, you know, for Yahoo, it, it's been interesting because to your point, we've been doing AI ML for years, right? You go to the Yahoo homepage, it's everywhere on the homepage. It's how we curate your news, it's how we personalize your content, it's how we organize your inbox. Um, but we had to remind people that we'd been doing that for years. What's changing is the expectation on the customer experience. That bar is only rising, and that's something that all companies are thinking about now. Before it was, you know, a year ago, it was, I expect my experience to be personalized. Two years from now, it's going to be, or a year from now, it's going to be, I expect this content to be generated specifically for me. And so as a company, you know, we're thinking about how do we raise the bar with these customer expectations that over the last year have just skyrocketed in terms of... What they, what they want. So I think that's a great point, and I do agree that the consumer adoption has been the catalyst for this as the tipping point. Um, but I do wonder, as we think about other hot topics, you know, just a year ago, even at Zeta Live, it was about digital transformation as the boardroom conversation. So Ramon, as we said, you're really driving this at Nationwide. Do you view AI as the sort of natural evolution of digital transformation, or does it represent a new vector of innovation? I think it's a bit of both. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the panel. It is an honor to be here with you guys. Uh, and I'll bring to the table the perspective of a Fortune 100 financial services company. And so we've looked at uh, the evolution of technology that allows me as a marketer to be more effective in the work that we do. So as CMO, uh, as I like to describe to people, there's an art and a science to the work that we do. Uh, everyone has an opinion on the art. There's no question about that. But it is the science element that we're really focused on. This is going to allow us to be more effective in our customer segmentation, uh, be more efficient in uh, acquiring new consumers and building our brand, uh, and just get better and get smarter at the work that we're doing. And so, uh, as, as I think I've heard you say, this is not new for us. We've been at this for quite some time. The tools and capabilities that are available to us today and as this evolves is phenomenal. How we use this going forward will dictate who's going to win and lose in this space. Great. Lara? I would say it hasn't changed our strategy for digital transformation. It, it, digital transformation has been a big part of, you know, one of our biggest initiatives in the company for a couple years now. What it's done is it's really expedited and expanded how we're thinking about digital transformation. We know that we have to have AI at the heart of all of our digital transformation initiatives. Um, just on the developer front, when you think about the engineering teams, the the changes we've seen in the past year by enabling them with some of these tools, just in terms of productivity and delivery, speed of delivery, and you know, just re completely eliminating repetitive tasks. I mean, that, that's a total game changer for a company like ours. So it really is at the heart of what we're doing, um, and you know, and it has been uh, for the last couple of years. Yeah. And Matt, how about at Discover? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It's it's a it's a continuation of of what we've already been doing. It's just another name. And so I, I think a lot about when we went from DMPs to CDPs to reverse ETL to compostable CDPs. They're all kind of the same thing. You're just trying to get customer data together, structured well. And and AI is is you know using the tooling that we have with with generative AI can enable things that we're already trying to do. You can build a data schema for, you know, for bringing data in without having to have somebody kind of learn the data, write the data. You can um, build a uh, creative brief um, and, and get your, give yourself a starting point and give you, you know, build those structures into your everyday activities that we're already trying to find ways to use technology to improve process, to speed things up. So it, to me, it's a continuation. Yeah, and of course, in your own personal life, I guess you're doing uh, this as well. <laughs> I, I'm trying to I'm trying to build my own travel tools, plan a trip in in you know, 
in a in a couple of different uh, commands in in yeah. GPT. No, it's uh, it's it's interesting again the consumer converging with the business side, mm -hmm. and so you know you brought up the point around some of the data transformation that's going on at Discover. Something similar is happening at, at Nationwide, and I know for companies you work with, as well as those that you consult, uh, Janet. And I think the digital transformation and data transformation was also a tipping point in the evolution of to what we call the modern CMO, where the CMO was a co-pilot or even a pilot on what have historically been technological projects. Yeah. So. Uh, I want to kick off with uh, with Janet um, to talk about the evolution of the CMO role because as AI has become a boardroom topic, we see a, this modern CMO with not only a seat at the table, but in many cases, they're at the head of the table. What, what are you seeing? Well, I think one of the reasons that CMOs are, are leading this is, I think it happens with a lot of emerging technology. I think CMOs often sit at the in the zeitgeist on so many emerging technologies and topics. I think we saw that with the metaverse, we saw that with Web3, and I think we're seeing that with AI because I think when you look at who is leading, as you point out, data and digital transformation, I do want to make sure we don't uh, um, under-emphasize the data transformation required to power a digital transformation, required to power AI. You need foundational data quality to enable it. The CMOs appreciate that because they know that they can't drive the business outcomes without that. So they have had a front seat in leading that digital transformation, have a vested interest in capitalizing on the value of AI. I think the second point I would make about why CMOs are leading this is they sit in two of the commercial functions most disrupted by generative AI. We just did a survey, and when you look at uh, the functions across the company, 49% of the generative AI use cases that companies are looking at are in sales and marketing, followed with a pretty sharp dip by R&D and innovation. So when you think about that, it's natural that they are feeling that both opportunity and disruption. Uh, and then the third point is, and I think this is really important, CMOs have superpowers that we need to recognize that go far beyond marketing transformation. They appreciate the human emotion that is required to transform organizations at the enterprise level. So if AI will disrupt not just each function, but how those functions connect, we need CMOs and the appreciation they have for how humans embrace and adopt things to really drive the AI transformation. Yeah, no, great point. And Ramon, you're a modern CMO, but also a non-traditional CMO in that you didn't grow up in marketing. So what's your perspective on that? Uh, first of all, it's impressive to know that I have superpowers. That's terrific. You do. I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, I think you're exactly right. Uh, if you think about the discipline of marketing today, uh, we will not make progress without solid technology. Uh, and the progress that's made in the AI space will only make that technology better. Uh, my marketing tech team is here actually in the audience, so we're looking to learn from all of our partners that are here, but we also realize how important it is that we get this right. Uh, it will ac accelerate the creative process. We're not starting with a blank sheet of paper anymore. And so that's gonna raise the bar on what's expected in the creative space. In the data space, we've talked about that and how that's gonna make us more efficient in how we actually exercise the discipline of marketing. Uh, one other element that's particularly unique to the insurance industry, uh, we're a protection company. And so for everyone on the stage and everyone in the, in the room, whether you have Nationwide or some other carrier, you all have one of these types of products. And protecting your identity, protecting your data, uh, protecting uh, the information that surrounds uh, you as a consumer is critical to us. And so uh, it's assumed that we do this right. The minute we do it incorrectly, it's a part of the 24-hour news cycle. And so the better we get at utilizing these tools, the better we can uh, deliver our promise of being on your side. Great. See what I, see yeah, what I did there? That is, that, a, that is a superpower. So Matt, you're also in a regulatory intensive space. How is that coming into this conversation as well? I, I, the, the challenge with the, the regulatory environment for us is that we're still 
learning how our regulators are catching, are, are thinking about AI, how they're thinking about machine learning. And the challenge with regulations that are 20, 30 years old is that they don't necessarily consider. So we're, we're, we're partnering very closely uh, with our team in Washington as well as um, with, uh, with, with our regulators to help educate, understand, make sure that we're doing it in the right way. Uh, I look at Discover as being in two businesses. One is in risk mitigation. We, that's, that's an area that we've always used data and AI, um, or data and machine learning, I should say. Um, and the other is customer experience, right? And for a long time, customer experience is call Discover, and you speak to a wonderful person, and you get great service. And if you are a Discover customer, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and if you aren't, I can give you a link after, uh, after the talk. Um, Actually, we can give him a link. Excellent. You can. Um, but you know that piece of customer experience has actually become through an app, right? That's where customers want to experience our product, um, through, uh, through a digital experience. And all of those experiences need marketers to be part of creating that experience. So we really have to think about how are we making that better? How are we using technology to our advantage? How are we thinking about uh, creating the right experience to help somebody who may not have the background in credit that, um, or understand how a credit card works? Um, if they're using their card for the first time, do we give them a different experience or a different message to that customer than somebody who has a long history of credit? And we have to take that into account and bring the experience to the forefront. Great point. So I am going to talk through the impact of AI. So I'm just trying to stick with our, our clock. So you, know, you talked about AI as a, as a superpower. There's also this notion of AI as a super substitute. And there was a real world study that I'm highlighting here that is relatively new. A Wharton professor worked with BCG to determine the incremental value of AI as an enhancement. So the table on the left shows those consultants who used AI versus those who didn't. And not surprisingly, those who used AI did their jobs better as measured by speed and quality. What's interesting about the table to the right is that uh, BCG, an elite organization, still has high performers, average performers, and low performers. And what you see here is that both low performers and high performers benefited from the use of AI. Low performers benefited even more. So you have not only this capability or skill enhancement, you're seeing skill compression. Back to one of our key questions, is this a leveling of the playing field or is it an amplifier of competitive advantage? I'm gonna start with the impact on the enterprise, but I do wanna talk about a different lens from the individual. And so as you think about, say, 2023 into 2024, call it the short term, and then the longer term over five to 10 years. And I know it's a continuum, but operational efficiency versus effectiveness or business growth. Where do you see AI having the biggest impact? And we'll start with, uh, with Laura and we'll, we'll hear from the whole panel. For us, it, it really isn't an either or question. It really has to be a both question. And, and I think that's the case for most companies. It, I talked a little bit about the operational efficiency side. You know, that's that first big bucket where it, it's going to be a must have for, I think, all companies um, to be able to get more efficient, particularly when you have a large engineering base. But with all the business functions, it's quite frankly going to transform how we all work. So that's the first piece. And then the other two buckets, the way that we think about it on the innovation and growth side, are how do we invent on behalf of the customer utilizing AI as a tool with our existing products today? So all of the products, all of the reasons why people come to Yahoo today, how do we continue to invent new features and new offerings that customers really want? And again, that product market fit is really important. AI is not the solution. It is an assistive tool to you know, deliver for customers. And then the third bucket is really, how do we leverage AI to do completely new things as a business? You know, For us, we've got the data 
Um, we've got scale, we've got brand recognition, we have all these pieces and components that definitely put us ahead of the race, I would say. Um, probably, you know, like mile five of the race, but it, it, it's not the only thing. And, you know, the question around um, democratization, everyone is moving very fast right now. And so we, ha we are continually, you know, putting pressure on ourselves to invent and innovate in completely new areas outside of even our core businesses utilizing AI. Great. Ramon? Uh, Laura, I agree with you completely. Uh, as a new capability and as a tool, we will all have to use it. Uh, as a corporation, if I do not do it, it puts me at a competitive disadvantage because I know my, comp uh, my competition, my competitors, are all leaning into this, not just from an efficiency play, but as I mentioned earlier, I do believe that it will accelerate the creative process. And so I think you'll get to that end result faster. Uh, here's one thing that I, I think we're all still wrestling with, uh, and I'll stay in that area of creative. Uh, there is still a place for human ingenuity and creativity. Uh, and an example would be if you were in TikTok right now and you Googled Nationwide is on your side, uh, about a week ago, my daughter sent me a TikTok. It had 6,000 creators using our jingle. I went and looked at that just a couple of hours before we started today. Over 40,000 creators have taken that jingle Incredible. and it, they've made it their own. And so uh, that wasn't intentional. It wasn't derived based on some work that my team is doing. But what we will do behind the scene is optimize that and use tools that are available to us uh, to help to continue to build that brand. And so examples like that will continue to evolve utilizing this new capability that's available to us. Great. Matt? So I think, I think we'll see two areas of growth in the next year. And, and again, in a, regulata in a regulated industry, we're, we're being a little cautious about where we want to play. We have committees set up to really kind of think through all of these tough questions to make sure that we're doing things in the right way. The first area is filling gaps, things like documentation as, you know, as we're building out products. These are things that people, you know, historically haven't really wanted to do. Um, nobody likes to write documentation, uh, but you need it, right? And so being able to use things like generative AI to get you part of the way, I can see that becoming a potential use case. The other area that I'm personally fascinated in as a marketer, um, and uh, I'm giving away a little bit here uh, as, as to where I'm thinking right now, is, is search. Right? We, have we have customers that are going to use ChatGPT to search for a credit card. So what do I need to do differently in the way that I think about content marketing, the way that I think about SEO strategy, to backwards you know, back, uh, understand how those algorithms work, teach myself and my team how to think differently so that we can win? I mean, our competitors are going to get there. How do we get there first? So I'll give a very simple uh, point on this, which is on the operational efficiency, I think we're seeing a lot of micro use cases around AI, especially generative AI right now, which are around productivity and efficiency. I think we're going to see a dramatic shift to what I call macro use cases, which are around connecting the silos of the organization and helping us drive more business intelligence on how we co connect decision making, uh, sales to marketing, to pricing, to supply chain. Today, most of the things are around helping optimize within a function, and over time, we will create business and value growth by looking at how those decisions interact with each other, and we can create more value together. I think that's a great point. And the other thing I do want to touch on is the AI impact on individuals, and we've talked a little bit about this, where there is a, a real fear factor, uh, and that's as consumers, but also as workers. Um, so it's not just the accelerant case that we see is the BCG shows, there is also that replacement, that notion of the super substitute rather than the superpower. I just want to touch on this quickly because I know this has come up at Yahoo, which is one of the world's largest content creators. Yeah, I would just say that for for all of us, when we think about how we're utilizing AI, we always have to go back to what is our company mission and who are we trying to be for the for our customers. And at Yahoo, you know, our mission is to be the trusted guide of the internet. We all, we have been for 
you know, decades now. And that's across our home, news, entertainment, lifestyle, sports, finance. People come to Yahoo because they trust us. And when you look at AI's capabilities, it's, it's quite impressive, but it also has pretty major limitations, right? There is propensity for bias, for misinformation, um, inaccuracy. All of the models are trained on data that is, you know, that's happened in the past by, you know, scraping, um, you know, the web for information that's already existed. So nothing for looking to Ramon's point, there, it, there are major limitations in terms of original thought, creative thought. Those are all major problems when you're in the news business, right? I mean, you, you can't let those things inside your four walls. And so while we look at AI as definitely an enabler, um, we, we definitely establish tenants internally, you know, operating tenants and principles on how we use AI. And I think that's very important for companies because not just the data point where we want to protect our data and our users, but also on what we're creating for our customers. We want to make sure that we, we're keeping a very high bar and this is not going to, you know, it's not able yet to replace human judgment, human thought, um, and, and we have to be really careful with it too. So it's a great point, and you know we've talked a, a, a lot already about AI and marketing, and uh, uh, you know we were or we are moving towards a lightning round, shorter questions and shorter answers. But I want to start with talking about marketing um, and pose this question to the to the group, and it's it's I think very topical with some of the things that are going on. But ten years from now. It, will the majority of ads that people see be created by AI? Janet? I think they will be both inspired in terms of the data that fuels the original ideation, but the ideation will be human, and then the multiplicity of formats will be AI. Uh, I agree. It will be some type of partnership, just as it is today. Uh, this is just another tool that can help enhance that creativity process. I think half already are, right? I mean, it's already a big part of how we do marketing today. So yes, absolutely. I think it will be. I, I think at this point, all, pretty much all of search already is. And and as we get more visual and the ability to to create, you know, display and, and production quality, yes, absolutely. Great. Well, remember, SAG doesn't just represent Tom Cruise. It's also the person who's the voiceover for the Chevy Cruise. So let's now go into the lightning round. Yes, no's. So I think I have my clicker from yesterday. AI is a revolution or evolution? Revolution. Ramon. Evolution. Both, but revolution. The only difference is velocity, so I'll go uh, revolution. Chat GPT, the next Netscape or the next Google? Ramon. If I have to choose, I'll go Google. <laughs> Google. Netscape. I can't answer because we audit one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my wonderful chief of staff, Rachel, her answer to this question was, what's Netscape? <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are uh, 27 or under, it's from the 1900s. <laughs> Uh, it's an orange-flavored powdered drink developed by NASA for astronauts. <laughs> so, big tech dominates or AI democratizes? Laura. I think democratizes in a big way. I'm a fatalist. Dominates. <laughs> Janet. I actually think it's both. I absolutely agree uh, and love the democratization element of it. So at, uh, at Zeta, we're big believers that the future of AI is actually in pop culture. And one of my favorite movies is The Minority Report. And you know Tom Cruise standing in front of this intelligent console, lots of finger pointing. Um, it's also, when you go to a mall, this didn't envision the Amazon uh, phenomenon, um, but where you have all these individualized ads. So here's the question. What's going to come first, this intelligent marketer console or this individualized consumer experience everywhere? Matt. I think the consumer experience, I think the marketer console, as marketers, we know that we've been promised that for a long time. I just stopped believing it. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> Janet. Uh, I'm much more optimistic about uh, CX because I think we're on a collision course on the console because 
Everyone's doing data and AI. The media companies, the tech companies, uh, all of uh, all of the marketers themselves, and everything's uh, going to collide with each other. Ramon, the consumer experience—it's already here. Lara, consumer experience, definitely. All right. So now, last question. <laughs> Seventeen years ago, Taylor Swift had her first album. I think it was called Quadrophenia. Uh, Seventeen years later. It's the Eras tour. So 17 years from now, when she's touring with her husband, Travis Kelsey, <laughs> is it live in stadiums or hologram? Matt. It, still live. There's, there's just nothing like a live performance. And if Taylor Swift proves to be the next J-Lo, she's got a lot of Super Bowl, Super Bowl uh, experiences left in her. Aye, aye, aye. Lara. Definitely live. Just like vinyl is cool again, I think live is not going to go away. Janet, close us out. IRL, baby. <laughs> All right, thank you to a wonderful panel, and thank you, everyone.